You see, there are three different individuals and they have their own priorities and as they see it. Our eldest grandchild, who is Sagri's son, he is a musician. You can see the piano here, right here. And uh, he is right now over 30. Then you have a granddaughter who is my eldest girl's son. Daughter. As I beg your pardon, daughter. She is just six months or even less a junior to, uh, in age, that is, to Nirwan, who is our eldest. This one is called Meera and she belongs to Kavita. And then Malika doesn't have any children. But we have a lovely, yet another granddaughter to Sagri's uh, daughter, who is, we call her Min Min, because actually her name is Mrinalini. Lovely. Her name is Mrinalini. But she calls herself Min Min. Why? Because Nirwan thought that when he was, they were very young, he couldn't pronounce Min 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 So he said Min Min. <laughs> and that stuck. So he has given her the name, her old pen name or what do you call it. Or, uh, and each of them have been splendid in many ways. And each of them bring back quite a few uh, events. I wouldn't like to... Uh, Minalini or Min Min would play cricket at the age of one plus or two. She'll hold it like this and hit with the bat. Bat is bigger than her, taller than her. And uh, Nam Nam, we'll, uh, we'll ask him what's his name? He says Nam Nam. Oh. And he would always want to be carried. You know, when we was when we were in Alibar, he was a little baby. So he said, Tata, Tata, try and try and try and so I have to carry him so that he can see Ooh. a train Ooh. going by. And usually it's a good train, but no man. <laughs> he was excited. And uh, Meera, uh, Kavita's daughter, I have not had an opportunity to be with her long enough, but she's very close to me. So I think each one's with his or her personality have blossomed into a very lovely gadget. Oh, lovely, thank you. And you? Hi, lights. Uh, let me start with the youngest first. Um, Minmin Omidalini is now she, she did her MA at Goldsmiths College in Visual Sociology. Mm. Now, to be honest, neither of the grandparents had any clue as to what Visual Sociology was. She came for an interview for a scholarship to uh, Bombay. I think it was the um, uh, Inlap scholarship. And she came back saying, Ma, you know, Mama, I don't think I'm going to get this because the judges didn't have a clue Ooh. as to what visual sociology was. So when she tried to explain to them, they said, but why don't you do photography or do sociology? Uh, what is this about visual sociology? So you know, she's somebody who is um, not allowed herself to be shadowed, overshadowed by her brother, who is much more the extrovert and so on. But she is deep, she thinks a lot. As I said, she has some very, very unusual pursuits. So we are really, I'm very excited about what she might choose to do in the future. And then coming to number two, um, that is Meera. She's Meera, Husnara, Ahmed. I think one memory that stands out in my mind, she couldn't have been more than about 14 or 15. She's always been a footballer. Um, she used to play for the school team in America, they, they grew up in California. And one summer, someone somehow got her inspired to come and spend a summer in India, in Bombay, coaching slum children to play 
for the boy. And I just said to myself, my God, this girl has something which is very rare. You tell me how many kids who've grown up in India would be actually willing to, and then you see, we lived in Alibaba. For her to come and go was impossible. We had friends who actually sort of opened up their homes to her. She would be up at six in the morning, take a bus, go off to wherever this place was, you know, miles away. And I think she she's always said the lessons that she learned about sensitivity, about how deprived kids were of even the basics like opportunities to play. For me, that is one very important highlight which I think has de defined her character. The tragedy was that she had very severe head injuries on the football field a few years later when she was playing a, you know, some important tournament. And the doctor then just said, look, it's too serious if you have to play again and you get another injury like this, there is no saying what might happen. So she had to give up football. But anyway, as I said, she's taken it in her stride and she's quite remarkable. And as for Nirvan, yes, I think Ramu has um, explained to you that he's a musician. Um, he is someone who I said to him at the age of two that you actually should be a lawyer and not anything else, because he would always have a quick retort, whether it was us, whether it was anybody else, but it's amazing how creatively he has grown. And I, or both of us, take a little bit of credit, because they would come every summer and winter to spend their holidays with us in Aliba. And when they were very tiny, I said, oh God, how do I put these children to sleep? And I would play, uh, very soothing, whether it was Beethoven, Chopin, Mozart, to put them to sleep. And years later, when he started loving music, he said, you know, Amama, I think I developed my love for music because you played these to us when I didn't even know how to spell Bach or Beethoven. And that has remained in his mind. So these are three off-the-cuff, you know, memories that I have. How do you think the world has changed since you were a child and what aspects do you find fascinating or challenging for the younger generation? It's a challenging question and I think it really requires much more reflection uh, to really, I think, seriously address it because it, it's very easy to look at the superficialities. Yes, it's become a digital world. Yes, people are you know stuck with their mobiles all the time. Um, the fact that you ring up and order a swiggy to arrive with some food, you know, these are the kind of changes which actually for older people uh, we we really it sort of phases you sometimes. Um, but I just find it's very fascinating to have traveled some part of this journey and I guess because we've had the well the privilege of living as long as we have, we've actually seen how kids have got very different priorities. At the same time, how they have, at least what we have seen, they have been willing to make the adjustments uh, to deal with the older generation, which is particularly, say, people like us. Because suddenly now we have found ourselves also having to handle the cell phone, the computer, the, you know, whatever it is. And that they then are in the position of being the teachers and we are the taught. And I think that this role reversal has been of very great significance, at least for me personally. I've spent my life teaching and in education. And I think that that has been a very special kind of a, a, a learning. Uh, because I can see that as long as you are able to relate to them at their level, show an interest in the things that they are interested in, 
I do not ever see that there has been a generation gap. You find a lot of uh, our generation or even the, you know, of our daughter's generations, sort of in a way very rueful, regretful, oh, you know, youngsters don't have time for us anymore. I think the challenge is actually out for the older people uh, to be able to find ways in which you then become relevant and it's amazing what a different world it opens up to. So I go take them swimming, go for walks, do things with them and I think that it's just been you know a great joyful adventurous journey. Uh, one grandson, two granddaughters and I guess this is a, a response you'll hear from many grandparents. The loveliest thing is that you have all the fun and no responsibility. <laughs> boys and girls will be boys and girls, but it is a dramatic change to see the children, and they are not children, they are about in their thirties. Um, but they are a very special breed. You know, their own priorities, their own lives. And, and you know, grandparents are good to have, but so much and no more. Aww.